Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Writer's Edge. I'm your host, Christy Stratus, and if you're not already subscribed to The Writer's Edge, please take a minute to subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell. Tonight, we're going to be talking with award-winning author and New York Times best-selling author, Tosca Lee. So welcome, Tosca, and thanks for being with us. Hi, thank you for having me. Hello, everybody. First off, I'm going to tell you who Tosca is in 30 seconds or less. This is a new wow. part of our new feature of The Writer's Edge. So... Um, Tosca has won multiple awards and is a New York Times bestselling author, as you already know. She is a co-author and author of 11 books, soon to be 12. She's got another one coming out soon. She is a multi-genre author who has written from everything from biblical, historical to dystopian and YA thrillers, which is a great range. And her book, The Progeny, is in development for a TV series. Uh, so we've got a lot of great stuff to cover tonight. Um, so I wonder if we could just start out, Tosca, with you telling us just a little bit about your novel that is currently in development for a TV series, and that book is The Progeny. Sure, absolutely. Well, The Progeny is the story of a young woman. She's 21. Her name is Audra Ellison. And she doesn't know it at the beginning of the book, um, but she is the descendant of the infamous and very real historical figure, Elizabeth Bathroy. And if you know who Elizabeth Bathroy is, then you know that she was the most prolific female serial killer of all time. She lived in the late 1500s. And uh, history knows her as the blood countess. And she was rumored to have killed some 600 young women. Um, so anyway, back to Audra. Audra has opted to start her life over after choosing to undergo a procedure that erased the last two years of her memory. So at the beginning of the book, she's starting over in Maine. She doesn't know why she did that. She doesn't remember the last two years, and she thinks that she's just there to get a fresh start. And very quickly, she learns that, no, she didn't come to start over. She is there to hide because she is this descendant, and these descendants of Elizabeth Bathroy have been systematically hunted for 400 years. So she goes on the run and the story takes her all the way to the underground of Europe. And um, it's a run for your life, exciting <laughs> adventure through Europe. So that's the, the short part of it, yeah. That sounds great, especially it has historical aspect, it has thriller aspects, uh, probably some identity aspects. It sounds absolutely. really, really great. Lots of identity aspects, absolutely. Yeah. So could you tell us a little bit about the process, um, even if this is relatively new to you, just tell us about the process of what it's like to have your work picked up for TV? Yeah. Um, you know, it's these things always kind of start with somebody reaching out to you and um, which has happened, you know, in my career quite a few times. But I think that happens. Um, it can happen quite a lot. Um, studios, producers, um, people like that are always looking for intellectual property and so they may reach out and say hey are these rights available so um and that's actually a road we've been down a few times um and it's hard because you know stars have to align and lots of things have to come into play so um when uh radar pictures uh who is um they are the ones that are um at, at the forefront of this when they reached out it was initially about another book and then it kind of morphed into um, over to this series because the book they reached out about was currently being optioned by a different studio. Um, so um, yeah, uh, that, the book was actually um, being written at that time. So it's been a long process because I had to write it and then it came out and then I had to write the sequel. And um, so this has been quite a while in development. Um, They've teamed up, teamed up with uh, Ed Burns's Marlboro uh, Road Gang uh, production company. And um, yeah, we're kind of at that stage now where they're getting people attached to it and stuff. So it's been a real learning experience for me. I'm definitely not an expert in it, um, but you know, you kind of learn as you go. It's so exciting though to, to watch it develop in that way and know that now people are becoming attached to it and stuff. That sounds uh, yeah. really, really exciting to watch each part of it, you know, as it develops. Yeah. Very cool. It is. And, uh, Thank you. Yeah. And actually one of our questions in the chat from uh, Joe from Go and D Now, thanks for asking, is, mm -hmm. uh, is Ed Burns still attached to direct or produce uh, Tosca's TV series? 
Um, yes, it, and it's his, so his production company is one of the partners that's in on it. So uh, yeah, they're very much um, working on it right now in conjunction with Radar Pictures, so absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, so what would you say, may, do you think, anyway, um, makes the progeny marketable for um, TV or if it, what do you think makes it marketable for a live screen action? Well, I had an advantage on this one because we were already talking with Radar as I was working on the concept for these books and they were very interested from the get-go. Um, so I already had that in mind and so I knew um, kind of what I wanted to do with certain scenes. And in this book, this is all about youth culture. This is all about living hard in the moment. And one of the parts of the culture of these progeny is they have these underground masquerade uh, Baroque goth raves. And so I was writing this with costumes in mind, writing this with a visual, you know, imagery in mind, things that would be exciting to see. Um, so I would say, uh, back to the question, now I'm trying to remember what the question was, um, writing it, writing it with those visuals in mind. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, I think that's a big bonus. I think a lot of times I just visualize when I'm writing, um, just what is happening with my story and not necessarily how it would look on film, even though sometimes I might write in a cinematic way, I think it might be by accident, not so much because I'm actually imagining what could be done in a real yeah. film, you know? So mm -hmm. it, it could be just accidental in that way. Um, but that kind of leads me into um, another question that I wanted to ask you, which is um, if you were gonna write a new novel and you, or, you know, you were giving advice to someone else um, and you wanted to make sure that it was prime material to be picked up for TV or for a movie. Um, what do you think you would make sure was included? Um, now we know mm -hmm. that like, you know, visualizing is a really important aspect, but um, mm -hmm. you know, is there anything else in particular um, subject matter wise or anything else? Well, I think diversity is, is something. And I think um, having the opportunity um, for a, a writer who would come in later, a TV writer or a movie writer, to be able to run with different arcs or aspects of the story. I mean, you definitely can't be the kind of person who's going to hold too tightly to your story if you want it to go into this direction because, um, you know, I, I think that's part of the fun is to create this world and to let other people go play in it or see what they're going to do with it. So, um, and I think depending on the genre um romance you know can be a part of that um yeah but i you know and i, I think at the end of the day you just have to tell a great story i mean i it kind of all just goes back to that but leaving opportunities for lots of great character development i think is important Definitely, and along those lines, actually, um, someone from our audience has a question. Antonio, thank you for that question. Um, this is a great one. Does it change, when you're writing for the screen, uh, does it change the balance and importance between characters and plot? Um, not for me. Um, I Characters have always been really important to me. Of course, the plot part changes sometimes um, based on what genre I'm writing. And so for me, mm, it hasn't really. But I think, you know, you've really got to have those complex, interesting characters because without that, uh, I mean, obviously you have to have plot. Too. You have to have both. So I don't know, but I think you've got to have those really strong characters. That's my personal, you know, kind of bias, I guess. I think if there isn't great character development, it just can't be great in general, can it? Because we can't really yeah. relate. You've got mm -hmm. a lot of running around. You've got a lot of, I mean, you lose the personal stakes. I mean, I always say that in a, in a great story, it's like when you go to Disneyland and you get on a ride, like the Haunted Mansion ride or whatever ride it is, and you get in that little vehicle that's that takes you around. And that character is the vehicle for your reader who's going to go through that story and experience that story as your main character or characters. So, I mean, the stakes are so much higher if they are rooting for that character, love that character. So, yeah. 
That's a great way to put it. And I know that like sometimes when a book gets turned into a movie, uh, we've seen this, I'm sure you've experienced this with other books that turn into movies. It can be frustrating because they need to cut it down so far that you know some character development or important even plot points get cut. And unless you've read the book, it's sort of like, what's happening here? I don't understand why. Yeah, and you're not care as much. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, yeah I think I that can. is one of the challenges, definitely. Do you think that there's any particular genres that you would write specifically to make it to TV? I know you were saying it's good to involve um, things like thriller and romance. Would you say that multi-genre is a good idea or is there a particular one that you would aim for personally? Huh. You know, I, I do know that um, it's much easier and much more economical to make certain genres than others. So um, kind of your modern day contemporary romance or, you know, humor kind of um, is probably going to be a lot more economical to make. Um, whereas if you write a sprawling, you know, period drama, that's very expensive. So, um, yeah, I think it kind of might have to do with the cost of creating some of those things. That's a good point. And also, since you mentioned sprawling period dramas, we more often see them in TV series probably because maybe it's, I don't know, maybe you know more than I do, maybe it's more worth the cost if it's played out over time and people are constantly tuning in, or maybe it's just easier to get that character development in. I'm not sure, but that's a really interesting point that you brought up. Yeah, we do see quite a lot of that. I mean, especially when I think of like the Tudors or the White Queen or even Game of Thrones, which is fantasy too. But um, yeah, really, really drawn out. Um, but there's, you know, of course, some excellent movies like that, but um, it's expensive to do that stuff. So. Definitely. And we start encroaching <laughs> on three hour movies, right? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of costume stuff. <laughs> yeah, which is fun for us, but tough for them. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Would you say that there's anything in print, like if you were giving advice to someone um, and they asked you, uh, what do you think could hold my novel back from being considered for t a TV series or a movie? Do you have any advice uh, as to what could actually hold them back from being you know, made into a TV series or a movie? You know, um, I don't think that there's really any perfect equation. I think one of the best things you can do to increase your chances of getting optioned for a TV or a movie um, or any of those things is to get it into the hands of lots of readers. Because when readers are paying attention to stories, then Hollywood will pay attention to stories as well because they love those popular stories. Um, so I think that's one of the best things you can do. How do you get your book or your story into the hands of lots of readers? You write a great story that readers love and care about and a world that they don't want to leave. Um, so it, it really does all come down to great storytelling, connecting with readers, um, writing the stories and characters that are relatable. Um, and I think the rest, you know, part of it will take care of itself. And part of it, you know, it's, it, it kind of comes down to chance. I mean, you know, and things just kind of lining up at the right time. Sure, yeah, because I'm sure there are a lot of novels out there, traditional or indie published, that may be really great, but just don't get seen. Maybe they, I had actually read recently a memoir of a woman um, who actually ended up an award-winning author, but the road was not so easy where um, she was published and um, every time she published, it got overshadowed by something else. Like her second mm -hmm. book came out around 9-11, totally overshadowed, you know, of course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So things like that can definitely get in your way and there's nothing, I mean, you know. There's nothing you can do. Yeah, and I, there's nothing you can do. There comes a point, you know, if you do this writing as a career, there comes a point where you just have to be willing to say, I will do my best, I will give it my best work. But at the end of the day, there comes a point when, you know, certain results you kind of have to release. Yes, you still market. Yes, you try your best. Um, yes, you're out there relating to readers, whether it's on social media or going to book clubs, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, you know, you can drive yourself crazy. Um, if you don't, you know, if you aren't willing to kind of release the results at some point. That's true. Yeah, you could spend forever editing something, can't you? Oh, yeah, I could. I definitely could. <laughs> and that can hurt it, probably, actually. I, I think it might, actually, yeah. Yep. 
Um, do you think, uh, speaking, I, I was thinking about hot topic issues and some authors say that it's really important to involve hot topic issues, just important issues maybe that are timeless even, but in particular hot topic issues. Do you think that including modern hot topic issues in a novel works to its benefit with when an author's goal is to see their novel either in, made into a TV series or as a movie, or do you think that it actually dates the novel and then automatically lowers the chances it has of being picked up? You know, I don't know because that is a tough one. It's kind of like the question of, do you write to the market? You know, do you, do you write to what's hot? Well, you know, you write the book by the time you publish the book, by the time it releases, you know, that can be a year. It can be more than a year, you know, maybe you can do it a little faster than that, but a lot can change in that time. I, I do think there are some subjects that will always be important to talk about. Um, you know, race is one of them. Um, so it, we see now, you know, a lot happening around uh, women. Um, so, yeah, I think that there are certain things that will always kind of be evergreen. But I think at the end of the day, if you're going to devote months or a year of your life to writing a story and to marketing it and trying to get it into the hands of readers and then reliving it and talking about it all over again. It just needs to be a story that you love and that you believe in because that passion will shine through in your story and that's what's going to touch people. And when people are touched, that's when they start paying attention. That's a great point. And sometimes through those kinds of more timeless issues, like you were mentioning, you can touch people because they may have a tough time either relating in real life or they're just having a tough time in real life. They pick up your novel. They see that issue actually play out and they can sort of live it in in a good way, a bad way, whatever way it is. They can sort of, you know, it, maybe it's a little bit cathartic even sometimes to read someone else's experience. Absolutely. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's why we read fiction. You know, if we wanted to learn about certain things, we would just pick up a nonfiction book. You know, we would read the news, we would read articles, but we want to escape. We want to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes. We want to be Harry Potter for the day. We want to be whoever. So that's why we do it. Yeah, and Harry Potter even has, and and you know, a lot of fantasy in general also mm -hmm. has a lot of hot topic, hot button issues that are That's sort of funny. timeless um, and that a lot of people can relate to and end up being important books in their lives, especially if they're YA and they're reading it as a young adult, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So do you think, are there any novels that you've written uh, yourself that you would look at and like sort of analyze and say, you know what, I don't think this could be made into a movie. Um, and if there are any of those, uh, could you tell us why? You know, my very first um, novel is the story of a fallen angel telling his story to a guy, an editor who, who lives in Boston. And a lot of it is, you know, talking about his life before, kind of flashing back to his life before, the fallen angel's life, you know, before the, the creation of the earth, before time, all this stuff. And I think that would be an extreme challenge um, for a screenwriter. Um, I've had movie interest in that book before, but it would be an extreme challenge. Um, I would be very interested to see how another writer would approach it. Um, for me, it, it's hard to think of how that might be because it is so dialogue heavy because it is so flashback heavy and because it is you know it would require a lot of special effects and expensive there's that word again stuff like that so probably that one okay yeah that's that's really interesting and you know i i wouldn't have before you said all of this today i wouldn't have thought while writing something i wonder if this would be too expensive to make into a movie but it's a really good point, actually. And if that's your goal, then definitely, like you were saying before, again, just to return to that, picturing it in your head and sort of imagining, well, how difficult will this be to make? That's a really good point. It could be difficult. And, you know, flashbacks, while they work um, sometimes really well, it definitely depends on if it's flashback heavy or not. It could, I'm sure people could get lost in that in a movie it's, if it's too often or... Well, and I think it depends, too, on kind of the style of storytelling, because I think that in cinema and on TV, styles change. And you can see now, you know, so maybe maybe it's different now because you look at TV shows like This Is Us and the writing is definitely nonlinear. I mean, you're jumping you know, from the present and back to various different points back in time 
over and over. And the storytellers, the writers on that show are brilliant and they do it brilliantly. So, um, you know, maybe we're moving into a time of, you know, where, where stories don't have to be told linearly, you know, as much as they might have been in the past. I'm guessing. So yeah. I'm well, wondering. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's all we can do is, is <laughs> take some educated guesses. Yeah. But they're good points. <laughs> Uh, we have a couple of questions actually in the chat. Uh, thank you guys for asking uh, these great questions. Antonio says, um, how much do you change the vision to write for the screen than a book? Do you see the possibility of camera work beforehand or do you just let it go as it comes? Well, I don't know very much about camera work or any of those things. Um, so for me, I visualize the story um, just the way that I would have. That said, I watch a lot of TV. And I watch a lot of movies. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do. So, you know, I, I kind of, when I'm writing, I kind of visualize like that, though I don't really understand how all the making and stuff goes into it. So for me, you know, I just kind of do my thing mm -hmm. and, um, and go from there. And, you know, you, keep in mind too, whatever you put into something like a novel, if it's going to get made into TV or into a movie down the road, there's another writer who's going to be, um, casting their own vision based on your work there too. So, yeah, if you're not writing the screenplay, right? No, and I, I, I am not. <laughs> that actually answers the next question that we had. <laughs> that was perfect. Oh, actually, no. uh, Joe is asking, how involved will you be if the show goes past your novel's subject matter, and have they have you already had those discussions? Um, no, not really. I mean, we've had some discussions as far as what could be and what could happen in the story. Um, I, I understand that this is part of the process and I'm ex excited actually um, to see what other people might do with this world um, that I built. You know, it's like building a playground and saying, okay, go play, you know, and I'm cool with that. So, um, you know, they know that I'm here as a resource and I've been fortunate um, that they've, you know, wanted to be in contact and, you know, um, kind of let me know what's going on and stuff. Um, I'm always here to help, um, but I'm very excited to see what other imaginations come up with as well. Definitely. And th this is just one that I was thinking of as you were speaking. Um, I wonder, do you think that there's any difference if um, you write a novel in first person or third person? There's always that big question. Is first person more popular? Is third person more popular? And, you know, who gets turned off by what? Do you think either of those has anything to do um, with people's uh, maybe a movie, somebody who's making a movie or a TV series, whether they can sort of see it becoming a TV series or not? I don't think so. Um, I, I, that thought has actually never crossed my mind. I've written in both. I've written in first person past tense and first person present tense too. So, um, you know, I think it just comes down to kind of how you hear the story happening. Um, some readers don't like certain tenses, um, you know, and so I think you have to think of your readers first um, and just tell a great story. So for me, I don't really. I don't, I can't see why it would matter. Okay, yeah, I, I only wondered, um, I, I would yeah. think that it wouldn't make a difference either, but I wondered, um, since you've written now almost 12 books, you've written so many books, I wondered uh, if you had noticed anything in particular that was like a dead turn off with that. Not that I've noticed, not that I've noticed, you know, and I think too, you know, we evolve as, as authors, we evolve as we're writing too. And so we go through stages and we try new things and we're experimenting and, you know, we want to be doing that. We want to be trying new things because we don't want to just kind of get stuck in this rut of doing the same thing and kind of, you know, we want to be saying, what if I did it this way or, you know, whatever. So, you know, I think it's good to try all different kinds of things, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, can you tell us about the next book that's going to be coming out, your 12th book? Yes. Um, so I'm working on the galley proof pages for that right now. Actually, I was doing that tonight earlier. Um, it's called The Line Between. It comes out in January. It is about a young woman who it has just been kicked out of an apocalyptic cult just in time, just as a, a pandemic has hit the U.S. And it seems like the apocalypse that she was taught was always coming um, is finally here. 
So it's a, uh, it's a thriller and um, it's, it's been a lot of fun and I'm actually working on the second book to that right now. That's great. That's fantastic. So we have something to look forward to from you. We actually have two things to definitely look forward to from you and a TV series. That's <laughs> how exciting. Yay, yay, yay. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Can you tell the audience where they can find you online and on social media and everything if you have Absolutely. any signings coming up? Yeah, thank you for having me. And um, I'm on toscalee.com. It's T-O-S-C-A-L-E-E.com. I'm on most social media pretty much everywhere, and I have a new puppy. So if you go on, you can see pictures of my big puppies grown up a lot. So um, yeah, you can find me there, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, the usual stuff. So Great. Okay. Awesome. And you guys know me. I'm Christy Stratus, the host of The Writer's Edge. You can find us on thewritersedgeshow.com and you can find me on christystratus.com. You can also find me on all of the same <laughs> platforms. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, going off at 9 p.m. and it will be all about summer reading. What are readers looking for? What distinguishes a summer read from the rest of the year and much more. So thank you guys for coming. You asked some great questions and again thank you Tosco for taking the time to be with us tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much.